As you can see from your news and notes, for the few minutes that we have this morning, I want us to look at a lesson that I've entitled Signs of Congregational Decline. And I first want to look at a few statistics which are somewhat alarming and probably when you stop and think about it, you can say, well, yeah, that makes some sense. I've, I've, I've noticed that. First, we want to kind of chart the, the life cycle of, of a lot of congregations. Some congregations can survive over a very long period of time. Uh, I know of some groups down in southern Indiana that uh, have been in existence for 100, 120, 130 years, and there perhaps are places in other parts of the country that can even go back farther than that. I've also known, we've all known of congregations that tragically and sadly sometimes they have to close the doors. I remember I was talking to, to a gentleman of, of a congregation in southern Indiana and their numbers have kind of dwindled throughout the years and, and he was just telling me, he says, I'm scared to death I'll be a part of that generation that has to make that decision on, on whether or not the church can, can no longer survive. And certainly we, we hate to see that when, when that happens, but that often is this, this life, life cycle, which uh, the congregation begins, there's growth, there's a period of stability, and then decline, and then perhaps death. Now we need to keep in mind that's not the death of the Lord's church. The Lord's church continues, will prevail until Christ returns, but sometimes individuals, congregations, can suffer. This is an interesting statistic looking at the declining median worship attendance among U.S. congregations from a period of around 2000 to 2020, which is a period of 20 years. And as you go back to 2000, the, and this isn't just Church of Christ, but all churches, the, the average attendance, keep in mind that's average, obviously there's some that's much bigger, some that, that are much lower, but 137. And now in 20 years, that's dropped to 65. And that's just looking at, at the country uh, as a whole. And, and certainly this would also be true for a lot of groups uh, in, in the Church of Christ. And so this, this does cause us some concern. And a lot of times <coughs> congregations go through this and they struggle and, and uh, elderships and, and men's get together and say, well, what can we do? And uh, we, we've got to stop this this cycle. Uh, and, and there are things that, that you can do, uh, but sometimes we need to get back to, to the basics. Uh, in some cases, maybe we're focusing in the wrong areas, and we need to adjust that focus and, and look at what's truly important. Sometimes we need to step back and say, okay, uh, what is it that, that we, we need to be doing? And so uh, one of the first things that I want us to notice is that when congregations begin to climb, they start struggling with uh, cooperation and unity. Uh, sometimes brethren don't always get along. And there's other struggles. And when that begins to happen, it, and I've said in many business meetings where this starts to occur, then people can't agree on anything. Uh, I've been in business meetings. You've got maybe 20, 25 guys sitting in there trying to decide what kind of a vacuum cleaner to buy and that'll be a two-hour discussion. Now, that's just ridiculous. Spending two hours trying to figure out what kind of a vacuum cleaner to buy. And a lot of times, it's because there are some underlying, deep-seated issues. We can see that in our federal government today. We talk about the gridlock in Washington. And often that's due to people having other agendas, different philosophies. They don't like one another. They look at the other side as, as an enemy, so they can't agree on anything. It's not particularly the issue. Sometimes uh, a particular political body may be very supportive of, of something, but they're not going to vote for it because that's what the other side wants. And that can also happen and impact a congregation when we, we just can't get along and we can't agree on anything. It's kind of like between a husband and a wife. And they begin quarreling and they begin fighting. Uh, it's like, well, who's going to pick the kids up at school? That can, that can result in a knockdown, drag out battle between a husband and wife. They're talking about how busy they are and they've got to do this and that. And, and so they fight and they quarrel about it. It's often not that issue. It's not picking the kids up from school that's the problem. There's something else. Something else that's, that's going on. 
and and needs to be addressed. Either the husband and wife need to sit down and 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 talk about this. Maybe they need to seek professional help. Maybe they need to talk to some uh, older Christians, married couples in the church that could sit down with them and advise them and counsel them. Maybe there needs to be a Bible study. But often the, the issues, the thing that causes the debate is, is not the real problem. And, and that can often be true in congregations. We can, and I think that's one of the reasons Jesus our Lord offered this classic prayer found in John 17 verses 20 and 21. And notice what he says as he's praying to his God. I do not ask in behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didn't send me. Have you ever thought, we often talk about the Godhead, and we realize that there's three individuals, God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Have you ever thought about maybe if they'd have had a discussion, okay, should, should we send Jesus Christ to the earth to die on the cross? And God says, I think that's a good idea. And Jesus says, well, I don't think that's a very good idea because I'm the one that has to go down there and do all the suffering. And the Holy Spirit says, well, no, I don't think that's a good idea. And so they spend thousands of years <laughs> fighting and quarreling and bickering. No, the Bible reveals to us that they are one, one in purpose and function. And I realize it's hard for us to wrap our minds around that because as human beings, we cannot achieve this level of unity that exists within the Godhead. But it's something that we should strive for. And we need to address the, the issues that are truly significant. You know, sometimes you'll see two individuals, I've seen two gentlemen, and, and they never agree. Well, something happened five, ten years ago. Somebody said something. Somebody did something. That's the real problem. That's why they can never agree on anything, and they always fight and they quarrel. Perhaps there's even disagreement in Bible study classes, and they subject the entire congregation to all of this bicker, bickering and quarreling and fighting. What needs to be done is you need to set those two individuals down and talk about the real issue. We, we spoke a little bit about that in our conflict resolution class. We was looking at, at uh, being peacemakers and the, the attitude that, that we need to have. In 1 Peter 3, verses 8 through 9, to sum up, let all be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead, for you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. I'd like to, to zero in here especially, don't return insult for insult. Sometimes if someone insults us, what do we think? Well, I've got to return the favor. If they're going to insult me, I'm going to insult them. And some people are pretty quick on their feet, and they can come up with some doozies. But they can also be very hurtful. And it just escalates everything. Someone insults you, you insult them back, then they insult you. And then what happens? You try to top the other one. And it, they get more and more hurtful. And it, it just escalates the tensions between the two individuals. And so sometimes we, we have to try to, to step away. We cannot return insult for insult. That's, or evil for evil. But he says, but giving a blessing instead. That's a little bit hard, isn't it? Somebody insults you and you're going to give them a blessing? With, with well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it or say something good about them. But you see, in many cases, that, that will help diffuse the situation. And I've seen that happen in some, some business meetings where, you know, two people are kind of going at it and getting a little bit hot under the collar. And I've heard some individuals say, you know, I, I apologize for interrupting, but I think this would be a good time for a prayer. <laughs> and they offer up a prayer, and that just kind of calms everyone down. People kind of back up a little bit. They realize what it's all about. And that, I'm not saying that works in all instances, but it can help. In Acts 2 verse 46, we see the first century church. We've been looking at this in our Wednesday evening Bible class on Acts. It says, and day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. They were glad to be part of the congregation. 
So we see that a warning sign of a congregation of decline is when brethren can't get along and they begin fighting and quarreling over everything. Now, that's not to say we can't have disagreements. People, you get a group of people together, there's, there's going to be disagreements and maybe there needs to be a discussion. And it may require a lot of work and discussion to come up with a consensus. But we're talking about to where it, it becomes uh, severe and irritating and counterproductive for the congregation. That's evidence of a decline. Well, something else that we can see, another kind of decline, is when people lose their concern for Bible authority. And we've seen that happen in the denominational world and the religious world in general. And sadly and tragically, it also happens in churches of Christ, where people want to set aside the scriptures. I've actually heard individuals say, well, I'm getting tired of hearing about the Bible. We've got to do this and we've got to do that. I about fell out, I was sitting in a business meeting when I heard that, I about fell out of my seat. Of course, that gave me some material for a lot of good sermons uh, in the future. But sometimes that's, that's the way people begin to progress. And that's indicative of a, of a spiritual client. You see, so often we think, well, the, the, only thing we're, the only way we can define spiritual decline are the numbers on the board. If attendance is up, if contribution is up, we're a growing, thriving congregation. If, if they're lower, well, th then we got problems. And that's not necessarily true. Sometimes you can have, the numbers can be up. A lot of attendance, a uh, good contribution, but people aren't getting along. There's a lot of spiritual weakness there. And then I've also seen groups that maybe are small in number. Maybe their, their contribution isn't extraordinary, but they're a close-knit group, and they love each other, and there's a lot of, a lot of communication. I don't think necessarily God is always looking at numbers. And, and so we, we need to be careful that we don't get overly concerned and depressed. Now, certainly, we, we want to grow. And as I mentioned in my prayer earlier, God has promised to give the increase. But we need to be careful at looking that as the all-encompassing determination as to whether or not a congregation is, is declining or, or growing. In 2 John verse 9, notice what John says. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teachings of Christ, does not have God, the one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. We need to be careful about exceeding the scope and the authority of of Christ. We see people have done that with instrumental music. We, you know, somebody may say, well, let, let's bring in a little small carnival or something out in the, the parking lot, and, and that'll bring people in from the community. And I have no doubt it probably would bring in a lot of people from, from the community. But where do we find any authority for that in the scriptures? We're getting into the realm of entertainment. People are using entertainment as an evangelistic tool or device. Nowhere are we going to find that in the scriptures. The gospel is where the power is at. The gospel is what draws people in. And if we use an artificial means, then we're going to get an artificial result. That's, that's not true. It may temporarily boost our numbers, our group, but we see that we begin to exceed authority. And, and once you open that door to doctrinal error, you know, some people, they, you know, I, I remember back during the institutional era, and, uh, the people said, well, we, we just want a little bit. We just want to crack that door open a little bit. We need to be a little bit more open-minded. And what happened? Well, then that door just got slammed open, and, and then everything, a lot of things began pouring in. And that's an indication of congregational decline. In Deuteronomy 12, verse 32, whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to nor take away from it. The advice that, that God was giving Moses and Aaron and the children of Israel, and we see that they struggled with this. Part of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only him thou wilt serve. Thou wilt not worship idols. God was very specific about that, but that is one of the very first things the children of Israel violated, disobeyed. 
They wanted to worship the other idols in the land. They wanted to be like other people. And so we see that they did add and they did subtract and they suffered because of that. We see a very, very similar words used in Revelation 22 verses 18 through 19. They were neither to add or subtract. That particular phrase and expression appears several times in scripture and it's still true today. God doesn't wanting us going too far as John spoke of in 2 John 9. In Colossians 3 and verse 17, Paul said, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. And when it says, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, it means by the authority of the Lord Jesus. So often congregations get together and they say, well, we can do anything we want to do as long as we agree. We all agree on that, whether leadership, or they'll say, well, we'll take a vote. And if everyone votes that they want to do this, that's all the authority we need. But the scriptures are clear that God is our source of authority. We must comply with what he says. If not, we're going to start seeing a decline. Well, we can also begin to see a decline in interest in worship. Sometimes congregations, I've been in congregations where it seems like, you know, almost everyone's attending. I remember going out east in, in Connecticut when Jeremy was, was living there. The congregation that he was worshiping with uh, invited me to come hold a meeting. I think I held a couple meetings out there. Very small group. A lot of the groups are small out east. It's maybe 15 people, 16 people. And you go to other places of the country and they say, well, that, that's, that's a weak congregation. They're, they're, you know, they, they got no more than 15 people. But I'll tell you this, during that gospel meeting, almost all of those 15 people were there every night. And, and so that, that demonstrated some strength. And there are some congregations that are much larger, two, 300, 400. They, they could make that claim. And the, that's the thing I've noticed, that with larger congregations, I know some in southern Indiana, they might have four or 500 on Sunday morning. But on Sunday night and Wednesday, it drops to half that. So that's indicative of, of a decline. And, and so all the people say, well, as long as we keep those numbers up on Sunday morning, that we're, we're golden. Well, not necessarily so. When you have people who are no longer interested in attending Bible study, they don't always want to be there when the doors are open, when people are looking for excuses to stay home. That's an indication that you're having some congregational decline. And I think this is taught throughout scripture. In Psalm 122, 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. This is David talking. Psalm 26, 8, O Lord, I love the habitation of thy house and the place where thy glory dwells. Psalm 147, verse 1, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is becoming. That's one of the things that we do in our worship is we praise our God. We praise him because we love him. We're going to talk about that here in just a few minutes. We acknowledge him as our creator. And that's something that we should enjoy doing. I've heard some people say, well, I don't like singing. I'm not any good at it. Well, God didn't say that you had to be good at it. But you need to sing from the heart. Singing is, is a part of is a way and a means by which we praise our God. Most of our songs are acknowledging what God has done and what Jesus has done and the blessings. And we're thankful for all of God's blessings. It, it helps us to express our praise for our Heavenly Father. And if you lose interest in that, well, I don't want to sing and I don't want to pray. Well, then you have no business being in heaven because that's what heaven's all about. It's praising our God. When you lose joy in worship or that, and that can become infectious and spread throughout a congregation, the congregation is eventually going to decline. Now, that may not be instantaneous. Sometimes the decline is, is slow, perhaps over a period of years, maybe even decades. It can start out very slowly. Satan is, is very subtle in how he approaches the church. You know, one of the things we're, we're looking at in our study in Acts about the early church is that 
that uh, Satan began with, with external persecution from the outside that caused problems. But he saw that just simply made the church stronger. Well, then he began with internal persecution where there was a lot of fighting and quarreling and people not able to get along. And it seemed like he got a lot more mileage with that than the external persecution coming from governing authorities. And that is a tactic that the old devil has used for millennia. In that if I can get people arguing with each other, they're not going to be effective. They're not going to be able to go out and evangelize or teach the gospel. They're going to be too busy fighting and quarreling. And so Satan just sets backs and laughs and says, look at all those fools. Up there worrying about what kind of vacuum cleaner to buy or what color we're going to paint the walls. And they're focusing on all those things rather than what is really important. Well, something else that we can begin to see over a period, and this is something that can impact us over a very lengthy period of time, is our loyalty and commitment to God. Not only us individually, but also the congregation. We mentioned earlier about attendance and attending the worship service assembly. Well, some people, they, at one point, they uh, were very supportive of the church. I remember as, as I was studying for this lesson, I read an interesting article about uh, the builder generation, which... Is everyone born before, I think before 1945 or 1946 and then the baby boom generation, but the builder generation, early part of the 20th century, they, they did a lot of building. They did a lot of things. They fought two world wars. They had to live through a depression. They, they were a tough group. And, and the, the individual writing this article was saying, you know what, Th this is the group of people that have really kept congregations and churches thriving because they're loyal to the congregation. And they're going to be there every day that the doors are open and they're going to be supportive no matter what during the good times and the bad times. Well, that generation is dying out. Now we're going to have other generations and they're not quite as loyal as they used to be. They're easily distracted. They're not always going to be supportive. Sometimes they, they get discouraged and they just decide to, to stay away. And so the point is, what's going to happen to future congregations? What's going to happen to their, their being able to grow and flourish? Because there isn't this same level of loyalty and commitment that there once was years ago. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. This is the, what Paul says. Be steadfast, immovable. That means being consistent. You know, I've been a part of several congregations uh, during my preaching career, and, and uh, I've known in all those congregations individuals you can always count on. You know they're always going to be at service. If there's some kind of need, they're going to be the one of the first ones in line to help out. If something needs to be done to the church building or the grounds, they're going to be there. If you're going to have a work party, we, we got to get together and do some work, they're there. Someone's sick or ill and food needs to be prepared and taken to them, they're one of the first ones to put their name on the list. You see, those are the kinds of individuals that, that we need to have at the congregation. And then I've known others who, somebody, well, we need somebody to do this, and they run out of the building as quickly as they can because they're afraid someone's going to ask them. They're trying to avoid and evade responsibility. That's not loyalty and commitment. And if more and more people are like that in a congregation, the congregation is going to begin to decline. Psalm 44, verse 18, our heart has not turned back and our steps have not deviated from thy way. Well, something else that we can see that I think can contribute to this decline is we begin to lose our appreciation for Jesus. Ask yourself this question. How many times have you heard a lesson or Bible class about Christ and his life. And if you've been, you know, most of us here have probably been members of the church for decades. And we say, oh, I've heard that over and over and over and over again. You know, it's kind of like watching a movie over and over again. Eventually, you know, unless it's something we strikes a chord with us and we really like it, there's some movies like that. But in most cases, you know, once or twice, that's enough. We don't need to see it again. 
And sometimes that's the way we feel about hearing about the life of Christ. Oh, oh yeah, I've heard that. I, I know all about it. I don't need to hear about it anymore. You ever wondered why Jesus and he instituted the Lord's Supper and we find the first century church doing that on every first day of the week? You know, there's been some religious groups say, well, no, no, we, we don't need to do that every first day of the week. Once a year is good enough. That's fine. Some people say, well, maybe we'll do it once a month or we'll do it once every three months. That way it, it makes it special. You know, there's all those kind of arguments that begin flying around. I think there was a good point that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, and we find the first century church doing this on every first day of the week, is that we, we need this reminder of how special this sacrifice is because as human beings we have a tendency of forgetting. That it becomes old hat, and it, it's not as special as what it once was, and we have to work at that to keep it before our minds. I, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a very big deal. The most significant point in history, of all of human history, Jesus Christ died for our sins. So that we can have forgiveness of sins. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Yes, we're baptized into Christ. We have remission of sins. All of our past sins are washed away. But that doesn't mean we stop sinning. We will continue to sin until we leave this earth. We try. Hopefully it becomes less and less frequent. But we will sin and fall short of the glory of God. But we have forgiveness of sins. No matter what we may have done, God will forgive us and restore us. That is significant. And we need to appreciate that. In 1 Peter 2 verse 24, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ provides for us forgiveness of sins. That is significant. It is important. And we need to be reminded of that continuously. In fact, just not every Lord's Day but every day. That's why we need to spend time in prayer and spend time in our Bible, reading about the things that Jesus has done for us. When we become parents and as we're bringing up small children, we need to tell them of the story of Jesus over and over and over again. Even when they're teenagers and they may roll their eyes at us, but we need to tell them so that it will stay with them throughout their lives, will be deep in their heart in their mind. Well, our final point this morning is congregation decline is, is often uh, affected by a declining love for God and Christ. Our love for God and Christ can, can wane and deteriorate. We all remember the enthusiasm and the passion that we had on the day that we became a Christian. We're baptized into Christ. But that begins to, to fail us as, as we age. We lose that passion. We lose that enthusiasm and desire. In Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40, And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and prophets. This was taught in the Old Testament. It was taught in the New Testament. What is to be our first love? God. Jesus Christ. What is to be our second love? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That includes our brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, someone may say, well, what about loving me? That's dead last. According to God. That's dead. That comes in last. That's not first. It's not second. 
But we see that often, and that seems to be the American way, we, we say, well, I, I have to come first, and I need me time, and, and I deserve to be happy. I, I, I. We love to use our personal pronouns, which demonstrates that we have a obsessive focus on ourselves and our happiness. If that's the attitude that is part of a congregation's outlook, that congregation is going to begin to decline and deteriorate spiritually. This is the passage of scripture that was read for our hearing just a few minutes ago. About a church in, in Ephesus, we're well acquainted with the church in Ephesus, it's mentioned in Acts and other locations throughout the scriptures. John, while on the Isle being uh, on the Isle of Patmos, he had this vision, was inspired, he wrote the book of Revelation probably around 90 A.D. It's regarded as the last inspired book that's included in, in the Bible. And we see that in Revelation 2 and 3 that there are three letters from the Lord written to, or excuse me, seven letters written to seven different congregations. And now as he's writing to the church in Ephesus, he says, I know your deeds, and your toil and your perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. Now if that was, was the end of the letter, they're looking pretty good. This is a group of people that are busy. This is a group of people that, that stood strong with the authority and rooting out false teaching and, and exposing false teachers. And we might stand up and say, amen, that's great, that's wonderful. But even though they had deeds and they persevered, which meant they were consistent. In other words, they, they weren't hot and cold. Cannot tolerate evil men. But he says, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I'm coming to you and remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. From outward appearances, the church in Ephesus may have appeared to be a thriving, growing congregation. The numbers were up, the contributions up. All, you know, we're, we're exposing religious error. But I think what the Lord's getting at is you're doing a lot of good things, but your motivations aren't right. You have different motivations. And he's telling us that, that deeds are important, but our chief motivation needs to be we do this because of our love for God and love for Jesus Christ. And sometimes we get our, we, the motivations, they, they blew her. Some preachers, they, they do remarkable work in the kingdom and, and great orators and they're responsible for leading many people to Christ but sometimes their motivations are, are not pure they're doing that because they want to make a name for themselves they want a reputation they want to look good in front of the brethren well that kind of sounds like what the Pharisees were up to and Jesus was very harsh and critical with them we need to be preaching and teaching and preachers need to remember this because of our love for God and Christ because of our love for Individuals who, who are lost and need the gospel and need to be helped. And even because they were doing all of these things, the Lord was not pleased. And he says, you need to repent of this. God's got to be number one. And unless you stop this, he's not coming and remove the lampstand out of his place. I think he's talking about he's going to remove their identity, being a part of the church universal. Of course, that's, that's only something the Lord could do. But that, that was the warning here. And so I think there, there's much that, that we, can, we can, can learn from this and some of the various points that we made, and no doubt we could add much more. We need to address congregational decline as early as possible because if left unchecked, it 
just continues to grow worse and worse and worse. And we, we don't want to see congregations going through the life cycle, the little chart that we looked at earlier, where eventually they have to close the doors. And we, we've all known of congregations that have had to do that through the years. That's sad, and that's tragic. And when that happens, the old devil wins. Perhaps we have one in our audience this morning who's subject in some way to the invitation. If you're not a Christian, we'd encourage you to come forward, repent of your sins, confess that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and then we can immerse you in the waters of baptism. Maybe you're a Christian, you've lost your way, you've drifted back into the world, maybe you've left your first love. We'd encourage you to come back, to realign yourself with the Lord, readjust.